my pleasure to introduce Martin Liebhaber from uh, Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin and the Free University in Berlin. Uh, Martin's here on exchange for one month, so if you see anything in this talk that you like, um, please by all means come and talk to him. He'll be here until the end of November. Uh, he's working with myself and with um, Rowan over at the School of Chemistry on, on this exchange program, and uh, he'll be telling us a little bit about our collaboration, but also a little bit about some work that he's done completely within uh, his institute in Berlin. So uh, let's uh, welcome Martin, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Murat, for your introduction, and welcome again um, to my talk. Yeah, today I will introduce you to some high-efficiency silicon heterotrunction solar cell concepts. So that's more on the conventional side. And then I will switch um, and go on with a third generation um, bi-triplet exciton generating hybrid device. But um, first of all, let me introduce myself. So where do I come from? I come from Germany in Europe. And yeah, I, this is Germany. So I used to grow up in the southern part of Germany. But then two years ago, I moved to Berlin, um, doing my PhD there at the Helmholtz Center Berlin. Um, yeah, Berlin is the capital city of Germany, so we have a lot of sites like the Brandenburger Tor here on the top, or the um, German Federal Ministry, maybe you have seen it in the news already. But what's Ber Berlin also famous for is it's a nightlife, it's crazy nightlife. And yeah, as we are heading now to Christmas, it's becoming colder and colder and most probably we will also have some snow. So, um, yeah, it's not a bad time for me to stay now uh, in the sunny uh, Sydney at this time. Hopefully there will be more sun in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, so Helmholtz Center is um, located in the suburbs of Berlin because uh, yeah, we need a lot of space for our large facilities, um, like you see here, our um, synchrotron ring building. Um, yeah, so I apologize for that, that's quite an old picture. Um, so now there's a new building um, which is called Emil. Maybe some of you have heard a uh, talk of my boss, um, Klaus Lips. He was here in March. Um, and yeah, I could only provide you a, a simulation of our new building, but I can promise you it looks more or less like that. And we moved in in, in May this year. Um, so as the name tells you, it's um, energy material in situ lab. And the unique thing is that we now uh, we can connect um, hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy using synchrotron radiation with um, state-of-the-art um, advanced um, sample preparation methods like plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition, sputtering tools. We do have thermal evaporations in UHV and UV. We also connected some glove boxes to the system, and then we can really perform in situ um, photoelectron spectroscopy, and we can vary the um, excitation energy from 10 to approximately 10,000 electron volts and therefore do some depth profiling in the samples. Um, yeah, so, but I don't want to advertise our new lab. I want to tell you about my research. And the first part will be a conventional concept. And then we'll talk about um, the valence band offset and the hole transport in the crystalline silicon amorphous silicon oxide heterojunction solar cell. Um, this is a cooperation with the Institute of Silicon Photovoltaics and the main people which are involved there is um, Lars Korte and Matthias Meves. But for sure many more people are involved and we also do get some financial support from the German Ministry of Research and Education and also from the European Commission. So as a starter, I want to introduce you to the, to the layer stack of a silicon heterojunction solar cell, which is, um, so we use conventional um, N-doped silicon um, crystalline silicon wafers. Then at the back side we fabricate uh, a back contact which consists of a thin intrinsic passivation layer followed by an N plus heavily doped amorphous silicon layer. And then for sure you need a metallization. On the front side we have an entire area passivation layer, a thin one, 5 nanometer thick of amorphous silicon followed by the P-doped emitter layer which forms the P-N junction. And then for sure, as we are at the front side, we need some um, transparent conductive oxide as a contact followed by a front metal grid. So maybe the main advantage of this technology are the excellent passivated contacts, which um, 
leads to really very high open circuit voltages of approximately 750 milli uh, millivolts. And the high potential of this technology is reflected in the actual world record for silicon-based photovoltaics, which is 25.6% on a single cell reported by Panasonic in the year 2014. And recently in a conference in the European PVSEC conference, um, one and a half month ago, they reported a new world record on the uh, whole module size, which is now 22.5%. Uh, so now one may ask, how can we further improve this technology? And one possibility would be to reduce the parasitic absorption here in the front contact layers in the amorphous front contact layers by using wider band gap materials. But for sure at the same time, you will by increasing the band gap of the material, you will at the same time um, change the band offsets. And that's what we're going to study, where we replaced um, the intrinsic passivation layer with amorphous silicon oxide layers. Um, so let's have a closer look at the band lineup, because this is going to be important during this talk. Um, so we have uh, the end doped crystal silicon wafer with its valence and conduction band, and then on top of it we grow amorphous silicon oxide layers, thin ones. And now you see, if we tune the optical band gap, if we increase the optical band gap by tuning the oxide concentration, we will for sure um, uh, vary the valence band offset as well as the conduction band offset. Another very important um, passivation uh, header interface. Uh, quantity is for sure the surface passivation. Um, yeah, now if we shine light on the solar cell, we will create um, electron hole pairs in the, in the absorber material. Um, the electrons will be extracted at the back side of the cell and the holes have to be extracted at the front side of the solar cell. And so I will have a closer look at the valence band offset and by implementing ident identically prepared layers in silicon heterojunction solar cells, at the end we can uh, discuss the whole transport mechanism, how the holes can transverse this um, transport barrier. And in principle there are um, two possibilities, either thermionic emission or tunneling hopping of the holes over this barrier. So let us start with the sample preparation. We prepare our samples or our thin layers with plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition and by varying the precursor gas mixtures of um, silane and carbon dioxide, we can vary the stoichiometry of our layers from pure amorphous silicon layers, which we use in our standard cells, to near stoichiometric silicon dioxide. Um, as a side note, uh, the hydrogen concentration we um, keep constant um, for um, saturating of dynamic bonds at the interface. Um, yeah, how do we now analyze the stoichiometry of our layers? Therefore, we conducted um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and we had a uh, and we did the sample transfer without. So the samples didn't see air at all because it's a quite surface sensitive technique. What you see on the bottom is. Uh, typical photoelectron spectroscopy spectrum where the binding energy is plotted against the intensity uh, uh, the photoelectron yield intensity and um, yeah so we start with a pure amorphous silicon um, signal which is um, which the core level peak of silicon 2p is located at approximately 99.6 electron volts now if we change the gas flow in the, uh, in the precursor gas flow in the PCVD you will see a chemical shift of this um, silicon 2p peak from 99.6 um, electron volts to approximately 104 electron volts um, for 80% uh, carbon dioxide um, concentration. And what you also see, the, the silicon peak related to the silicon-silicon bond is um, reduced and is nearly um, yeah, zero for this high um, oxygen-rich, for the oxygen-rich samples. So let us have a closer look this uh, chemical shift of the silicon 2p core level peak. Um, so the shift of the core level strongly depends um, on the chemical near field surrounding of the, sil of the central silicon atoms. And it depends, therefore it depends how many oxygen atoms are um, connected to the central atom, either if it's one, two, three or four oxygen atoms, which corresponds to the various oxidation states of silicon. And each of these oxidation states have element-specific binding energies. And those binding energies you keep fixed, and then you can, you can fit your photoelectron spectroscopy data. And 
then you can um, set the relative um, peak intensity ratios um, uh, relative to each other and you can calculate the oxygen concentration of your layer. On the bottom here, a uh, sample fit procedure is shown um, for a mid-range oxide um, which is uh, 6 um, cubic, uh, standard cubic centimeter gas flow of um, carbon dioxide. Um, so if you do so, um, w you can come up with a calibration or conversion curve where we can now relate the, the, the gas flow rates of silane and carbon dioxide to the stoichiometry in our layers. And this is what you see in here, starting with pure morphosilicon and ending up with um, nearly stoichiometric silicon dioxide. We cross-check this procedure I have shown you in the slide before with uh, some other core level peaks, the oxygen 1S and the silicon 2S, and you have to take into account the um, atomic sensitivity factors for the several core levels. Now it is um, in good agreement. And yeah, the last point what I wanted to point out here is that um, we have a nonlinear dependency um, of the stoichiometry on the gas phase composition in our PECVD setup. Um, so the question is now, how does the stoichiometry affect the valence band position? Uh, the valence band position we measured with ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. And um, so we conducted two methods. The standard method, maybe some of you are familiar with it, is the so-called helium UPS um, method, where you use helium discharge lamp at an excitation energy of 21.2 electron volts. But then at our uh, center we have a special variant um, established by Lars Korte, which is called the um, constant final state yield spectroscopy, where we excite the sample now, where we vary the exciting energy between 4 and 7.3 electron volts by using a high pressure xenon lamp and a double grating monochromator. And we keep the analyzer um, at a constant um, energy. This method has a an order of magnitude lower detection limit, and this allows us, um, as you see here in the, model in, the, in the density of states, so there are points, are data points, um, this allows us also to, um, to, to resolve the Urbach energy, so valence band tail slopes, and even mid-gap states related to dangling bonds. Um, and by modeling <coughs> this um, experimentally obtained um, density of states, um, we can extract the valence band position, which is here the cross, uh, circle cross, the Obach energy and the dangling bond defects. So this is the whole da data set of our stoichiometry series, um, starting from the pure morphosilicon, which is the, the black line, and then increasing step by step the oxygen concentration. What you see is that the, the cross circle here, that the valence band um, shifts towards higher binding energies, and that a specific um, yeah, at um, the sample with um, 0 0.84 oxygen concentration, um, we cannot further track the evolution because the um, low excitation energy of 4 to 7 electron volts is not um, sufficient enough to further track the evolution and therefore we had to shift to the standard method, the helium UPS, um, to further track the valence band and this is what you see here on the right hand side. Um, due to the lack of sensitivity we are now not are longer able to resolve um, mid-gap states, but we, we extract the valence band edge position um, by um, a linear extrapolation of the valence band leading edge to zero, and the valence band then is marked here with the arrows. So to sum up, um, the valence band position we could measure with UPS. What is missing in the band lineup, if you, what you see here, is the surface band bending. The surface band bending you can measure uh, by using the technique uh, called surface photovoltage. This was done for all our layers. It stayed well below 150 milli electron volts, but we took it into account by calculating the valence band offset. So um, UPS measurement um, gave us, um, we started with standard 1.1 electron volts relative to the Fermi energy for standard amorphosilicon layers. We increased this um, valence band position to more than 5 electron volts for the near stoichiometric samples and while taking into account the surface band bending we can determine the valence band offset which we are interested in. And summary of all those studies uh, 
it's plotted here on the x-axis, the, the stoichiometry, which we determined with um, uh, XPS, so X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and the valence band offset, which was determined with the ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy in combination with surface photovoltage. And yeah, we start with a 270 milli electron volts um, valence band offset for pure morphosilicon, and we end up at approximately four or at more than four electron volts for the amorphous silicon dioxide samples. What you can also see here in this plot is that for the, for the standard helium UPS, the arrow bars um, are, are bigger due to the fact that we are lacking in intensity. Now, um, we implemented identically prepared um, layers in uh, silicon heterojunction solar cells, and therefore we are now able to co correlate the first time experimentally determined valence band offset directly to solar cell performance. Um, yeah, so the gray shaded area here shows um, the samples which we, uh, the layer stacks which we implemented into the heterojunction solar cells. And at the first step, we measured the defect density at the interface um, for the various the stoichiometry. And what you see is that um, the defect density or the interface quality is getting worse for higher oxygen concentration. But surprisingly, um, if we deposit it in a second step, the additional uh, emitter layer, um, the uh, interface uh, defect density decreases dr drastically, and we come up with a similar um, passivation quality as our standard um, amorphous silicon um, passivation layer. And we relate this effect to um, um, saturating. Uh, uh, silicon dangling bonds at the heterojunction during this additional plasma process, which is the emitted deposition, which is good um, for our cell, uh, solar cell performance, for sure. Um, yes, and this brings me already to the um, solar cell results, to the IV curves. Um, yeah, so on the top here, you see the IV curves, and these are measured data, no simulation data. Um, starting from the pure amorphous silicon passivation layer, which is the black one with an offset of 270 milli electron volts, <coughs> and then um, all um, with the rising oxygen concentration, we increase the valence band offset. And yeah, while having a closer look at the solar cell parameters, we see that the surface passivation, as I have shown you in the slide before, um, is sufficient good enough for all the layers. We do not really see um, varying um, VOC, so surface passivation seems to be okay. Um, the widening of the band gap, which should be reflected in the short circuit current, um, we do not really observe at all, but um, we did some simulation studies. Um, so the fact that we are only exchanging the very thin passivation layer and we are widening the band gap, um, so we came up, um, we, we took the optical data of our layers and we came up that only 0.6 milliamps per square centimeters were expected. But um, for sure, the big differences um, which you can see here is the, is the change in the, in the solar cells fill factor <coughs> due to the increasing band offset, which is related to the transport barrier. Um, yeah, and to go a little bit more into detail for that, I draw again uh, for you the, the valence uh, or the, the band lineup. So here in blue we have the absorber, which is the endocrystalline silicon. Then we have our thin passivation layer, uh, in our case the intrinsic amorphous silicon oxides, and then followed by a p-doped amorphous silicon emitter layer. So now while increasing the oxygen concentration, we will increase the valence band offset. And um, we have seen our own simulation studies, and this is also in accordance <coughs> to other simulation studies, that holes can transverse this, um, this uh, transport, transport barrier up to a value of approximately, for small uh, valence band offset, up to a value of approximately 400 to 450 milli electron volts. But then, for the higher, um, for the higher valence band offsets, it turns out that there must be an additional um, pathway 
for the holes to transverse this barrier, which um, we relate to tunneling, hopping through the valence band tail states. Um, yeah, so, but our initial motivation was to increase um, the optical band gap in order to increase um, the short circuit current. Um, but now we see if we increase the band, um, the band gap, uh, we increase the valence band offset and the fill factor will go down drastically. So that will not help us at all. But to mitigate this problem, we came up with an idea, um, which is a stacked passivation layer. And this I want to introduce you on this slide. So what we did is we um, replaced our intrinsic amorphous silicon oxide layer with a the single layer with a layer stack. So we split it into two. And so the single layer, um, which an overall or with total valence band offset of 585 milli electron volts, you already see that um, we have a clear S shape in the solar cell IV curve. And now, while implementing the stack, so putting a step of amorphous silicon and then the amorphous silicon oxide with the same total valence band offset, we could increase, um, we could drastically increase the solar cell fill factor by, um, yeah, from 63 to 70%. So, um, we proved that a staircase of valence band offset could improve the solar cell fill factor, and this is especially a promising concept if we are now thinking about um, combining a moderate band gap passivation layer with a high band gap uh, with a high band gap um, emitter layer, because then we are dealing with uh, thicker layers, and you could gain more. Uh, yeah, we could, in the in terms of current gain, could could be improved even more. Um, yeah, and this brings me already to the conclusion of the first part of my talk. So we are able to grow intrinsic amorphous silicon oxide layers um, with PCVD. We determined um, the stoichiometry of our layers with X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. The valence band offset was determined with ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy in combination with surface photovoltage. Um, we have seen that the surface passivation is sufficient, good enough for all our oxide layers after emitted deposition. Um, we have implemented identically prepared layers into silicon heterotransition solar cells in the low X regime. And therefore, we are now able to, um, to directly correlate experimentally determined um, valence band offsets to solar cell fill factor. And we can discuss the whole transport mechanism, which is thermionic emission and tunneling, another pathway which opens for higher valence band offsets, which is tunneling hopping process. Um, yeah, the general challenge, as I pointed out already, is that we have a transport limitation due to the band offsets which we will induce by higher band gap materials. But um, we came up with a possible solution. So you could think about um, implementing band gap staircases and especially in combination with higher band gap emitters, this could be a promising concept to further improve this already very high efficiency silicon based um, technology. Yes, so this was the first part. Um, and I have to go on. Oh, I have to take a shot. Mm. I would like now to go on with another concept, also silicon-based concept, a third-generation concept, um, where yeah, we it's a concept for multi-exigent generation via um, singlet fission, and in our case we put tetracene on crystalline silicon. It's a joint project between the Helmholtz Center and the UNSW. And yeah, we got uh, funded this year by the German Academic Exchange Service. And this allowed us to, yeah, or allowed several researchers to exchange and to interact with each, uh, with each other. Maybe some of you have met or remember the talk of my boss, Klaus Lips. He was here at the UNSW in March this year and he introduced you to the Emil lab. Um, then later on this year, um, Murat and Ron came to Berlin doing some EPR studies on upconversion materials. 
And finally, now um, this month, I will be here um, doing some ultra-fast um, photoluminescence measurements and studying the dynamics of the tetracene, of the thin film tetracene in our hybrid um, down conversion devices. But for sure, also in this project, many more people are involved. Um, yeah, so as a motivation, I brought you this uh, plot. So what is, what is drawn is um, the, the band gap of um, PV absorber. So and I'm speaking now about single band gap PV materials um, over the theoretical limit of the, uh, uh, of the conversion efficiency. And what you see is um, that for um, higher band gap PV materials like thin film amorphous silicon, perovskites, or organic um, photovoltaic, you can gain a lot of efficiency um, while with upconversion uh, materials. So the transmitted light, which uh, the transmission losses, you collect the transmitted light, which is not absorbed in the uh, which is not absorbed in the in the bulk at all. You collect, then you do some upconversion, and you reflect it back into the cell, which is then op uh, absorbed. Um, on the other side, on the standard crystal and silicon, where we or where I am gonna work on. Uh, we have a band gap of approximately 1.1 electron volts. You can gain a lot of efficiency with um, so-called multi-exigent generation, which is shown in literature for silicon nanocrystals, but I will focus on uh, the process called singlet fission. And so it is to overcome the thermalization losses. Um, yeah, and by combining both up conversion and down conversion for crystal and silicon, in theory, you can come up, uh, you can end up at uh, approximately 45%. Um, yeah, but the challenge will be, and as I pointed out in the first part of my talk, um, we are dealing with crystal and silicon, and this is already on a very high level. So it's a big challenge to, to compete with the standard crystal and silicon um, approaches or the heterojunction um, approach. Okay, so the singlet fission process is a yeah, it's quite known for a couple of years, so it was already observed in 1965 by Singh. And in principle, um, you have an organic chromophore which ex is excited in its singlet state. Then this chromophore shares its excitation energy with a neighboring um, chromophore also in its ground state. And then both are converted into a correlated triplet excited states. Um, the molecular states which are of interest here are well, the first one is the, the ground state where both electrons with spin up and spin down, so a total spin of zero, are in the, low, uh, in the homo, homo level. Then the excited singlet state um, where uh, one electron shifted to the LUMO, but we have still have an overall total spin zero. And then finally the triplet states um, where the total spin is one. But let us have a closer look um, at this singlet fission process in the electronic um, transition model. Um, yeah, so we have, we start with um, chromophores in the, in the, in the S0, in the ground state, and then we excite them, and this is on a very rapid uh, time scale of 100 femtoseconds. We excite the first chromophore in the S1 state. Then um, the, so the singlet fission process takes place on a rather um, quick time scale of approximately 100 picoseconds. Um, it shares the energy, the first molecule shares its energy with the second electron and both are converted into triplets. So these are correlated triplet states and in comparison to inter-system crossing you do not lose energy in this process. So in principle you create out of one incoming photon, you can create two correlated triplet excitons. Those triplet excitons ha are long-lived due to the fact that the, the transition from the T1 to the S0 state is spin forbidden. Um, so they live for approximately 100 nanoseconds in this thin film tetracine, but if you go to single, single crystals or other materials, they can even um, last longer in the range of microseconds. 
So the challenge will be now to ionize or to dissociate these triplet excitons at a hybrid interface or at a, to an electron accepting material. So I will show you in the following slides some literature results where um, this charge separation was um, observed, but the challenge will be to do this on crystalline silicon. And now we are dealing with a so we are dealing with a direct triplet energy transfer, and we're not speaking about um, a light emitting transfer processes. Okay, so what is the principle of our multi exogen generation device? We have on the bottom part we have a standard solar cell. So in our case it will be a crystal silicon where the, the long range, the lower energy light is absorbed, creating electron hole pairs. The electrons have to be extracted by the back side. The holes have to be extracted on the front side of the solar cell and for sure it has to transverse through the singlet fission organic material. Then the interesting part will be the high energy um, light, which will be then absorbed in the singlet fission medium and creating two, <coughs> two excitons, two correlated excitons via the singlet fission process. These triplet excitons then have to diffuse um, to, the, to the hybrid interface and there they have to be dissociated somehow and splitted and again the electrons have to be extracted at the back side and the holes have to be extracted at the front side of the solar cell. So this is in principle um, the concept, the singlet fission multi exogen generation device. Um, but the big question is how do we harvest triplets at all at this hybrid interfaces? So on the one side we have our organic material, then we have the interface and on the other side we have the inorganic material, in our case the crystalline silicon. So on the organic part, we're dealing with tightly bound Frankel excitons. Um, and on the inorganic part, we have um, delocalized Vonia excitons. So which tra charge transfer mechanisms could be in principle possible? So the first one would be a direct electron transfer where the hole stays in the organic part and the, el or the electron is directly transferred from the organic part to the inorganic uh, material. The second um, mechanism you can think about is um, first a type transition, which is a non-radiative transfer mechanism. And due to the fact that it's a, a dipole, dipole, dipole transition, it's a long range effect, but it will be spin forbidden for triplet excitons. Um, the next mechanism um, would be uh, the dexter type transfer, where the charges or trip, the whole triplet are all move from the organic to the inorganic part. Um, therefore, you need a wave function overlap, and this process is a rather short range um, process. But I would also like to point out all the challenges <laughs> which um, occurs this charge separation. Um, so you could think about um, localization effects. In the organic part, um, excitons are highly localized and they have momentum nearly zero. Um, and now, if we are dealing with uh, crystalline silicon, which is an indirect semiconductor, um, and we want to make a transition from the conduction to valence band, we, need, we always need an additional phonon. And maybe this could be a problem um, if you do not have enough momentum. Or the other thing we should think about is um, spin correlation. So in the organic part, um, the triplet excitons are uh, spin correlated and we have to lose this spin correlation. And therefore, maybe heavy atoms, like I will show you in the next slide, um, lead could be helpful uh, in terms of spin orbit coupling. So um, next two slides will be a little bit of literature re review. Um, but this is all really new stuff. So it was um, published in Nature Material last year, at the end of last year by groups of, um, o uh, of Cambridge and the MIT. And so I wanted to introduce you to this study. They, they used um, pentacene and tetracene as the organic material, and they put it, it on, um, on lead selenide and lead sulfide nanocrystals. And then they performed transient optical absorption measurements, so they studied the dynamics um, to come up with a charge transfer mechanism. Um, so the first thing you could think about, and I, I introduced you in the last slide, was the, 
the direct electron transfer via charge transfer state, but it turned out that this is not going to happen, at least in this uh, system. So they measured, or they came up with a, um, with a model that the whole triplet um, is transferred from the organic to the inorganic part, um, which is then a dexter type process. And then in a, next, in a second step, this, um, the, the whole triplet which was transferred to the nanocrystal, um, the whole is then transferred back into the, into the organic part. And they have clear evidence for that um, from transient optical absorption measurements. The cool thing with uh, nanocrystals for sure is um, by tuning the size of the crystals, um, you can also tune the, the band gap and therefore the band alignment. And they also saw that an efficient um, transfer only occurs at resonant conditions. So if the, if the connection band of the nanocrystal is more or less in resonance um, to the energy um, level of the triplet state. And in this other study, they, um, uh, they changed the length of the nanocrystal ligands and they, um, they detected an exponential dependency of the transfer efficiency, um, which is another clear indicator that we are dealing with um, dexter type transfer mechanism because it's a short range mechanism and it's strongly dependent on the, on the spacing due to the length of the nanocrystal ligands. Okay, and another prominent example I wanted to show you is from one year earlier, 2013. Uh, it's a pure organic solar cell now. So I don't want to go into the details, but for sure you need an anode and you need a cathode. Um, you have they implemented an exciton blocking layer, but the interesting layers here are marked in red. It's a pentacene deposited on, on C60 as the electron accepting material. In pentacene, it's well known uh, that the singlet fission process takes place. And um, as you can see here in the external quantum efficiency curve, the red curve here, they, they measured an external quantum efficiency of over 100%. And this is a clear indicator um, that uh, we have, so that the singlet fission, which produces more than one um, exciton from one incoming photon can be, so first of all it can dissociate to the interface, there it can be, it can move to the interface and there it can be dissociated efficiently. Otherwise it's not possible to, to get external quantum efficiency of over 100% at this uh, specific wavelength. And I also wanted to note here that the same, or it was also proved by another group that the tetracene C60 interface works, although they did not reach external quantum efficiencies of over 100%. And yeah, as I have shown you in the slide before, so for sure also at um, lead selenide and lead sulfide nanocrystals, um, the charge uh, transfer works. And the cool thing is with the nanocrystals that you can tune the band gap and the band lineup, which, should, which is definitely important also for our crystal and silicon cell. Yeah, so let us move on to, to, to my devices, so tetracene and crystal and silicon. As I pointed out, the correct band lineup is important. And now we will, we will replace the pentacene, or we will not use pentacene as the singlet fission material. We need a higher band gap singlet fission, uh, singlet fission material, which is in our case um, tetracene. And we have to prove if the charge separation of the singlet fission created excitons um, happens at this hybrid interface. So this is my device structure. Um, you start again with standard commercial available N-doped crystalline silicon wafers. Then on the back side we fabricate our standard um, back contact, as I told you in the first part of the talk, intrinsic uh, passivation layer followed by a heavily doped M++ amorphous silicon layer acting as a back surface field, and then we put um, aluminium back contact. On the front side I thermally evaporate um, tetracene, which uh, the, the triplet energy of the tetracene is more or less hopefully at resonance conditions to the conduction band of crystal and silicon. And then on the front side, I spin code P.PSS followed by um, a silver grid. On the right hand side, um, then you see photographs of my hybrid self. So they are rather small, 
I produce one by one centimeter cells and I produce 0 0.5 pe top, uh, times 0 0.5 centimeter cells. Um, yeah, so let me first turn to the front contact, the hybrid front contact, because that's also interesting. And it is, this is another um, collaboration with uh, Sarah Jekle from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And yeah, we are able to, to produce um, <coughs> hybrid solar cells um, reaching 14% of efficiency just um, while um, optimizing the front contact between pilot PSS and crystalline silicon. And I wanted to point out that so we only did the optimization for the front contact and we want to learn how this front contact works. Um, we did not um, um, spend work on something like anti-reflection coating or better back contact. So we simply scratch an Indian Gallimon tactic at the back contact. And we do, do the whole process on planar wafers. Um, what we did is we varied the, the doping of the, of the silicon substrate. And then while um, fitting this IV curves, the dark and the, uh, and the illuminated ones, um, with um, models of a PN heterojunction as well as Schottky junction, we um, come up with a conclusion that this um, hybrid heterojunction can be described by, or has to be described by a heavily doped P plus N heterojunction, where the um, diffusion of minority carriers in the bulk silicon is the main mechanism and not like it was commonly assumed um, as a short git junction. Um, yeah, furthermore, I wanted to show you, as you are now familiar with band diagrams, and we established this also for the P dot PSS N type silicon heterojunction, I wanted to show it here also to you. And um, maybe the main important things are that we are dealing here with really highly p polymer, where we have valence band states even above the Fermi level. So we determined uh, the valence band edge position. Oh, if, if you want, it's not valence, it's an uh, p dot PSS is something in between. <laughs> so, um, but we determined the uh, valence band position to be 80 milli electrons above the Fermi level. And um, we also detected um, a strong inversion of the silicon at the surface, where the intrinsic, um, the intrinsic Fermi level even crosses the, the undoped um, Fermi level of silicon. OK, so this tells us that the front contact, in principle, um, should work. Uh, now we are turning to the hybrid cells with tetracine in between. So this is my reference cell without tetracine. On the left-hand side, you see the IV curve of the reference cell, and on the right-hand side, the, uh, the internal quantum efficiency. So the efficiency is plotted over the wavelength. Um, then, uh, in green, I plotted for you the absorption spectra of identically prepared, oh, so in the same RAM, I put it the tetracine on crystalline silicon, as well as on quartz glass, to take the absorption spectra. Um, so this is the green spectrum there, the absorption of tetracine. And in red now are the IV curves as well as uh, the external quantum, uh, internal quantum efficiency of um, the tetracine crystalline silicon hybrid device. So, and when we zoom in here more, we see that the absorption spectra of tetracine is directly reflected in the EQE. Um, so, what we see so far is a filter effect of tetracine. And this gives us no hint for any exciton dissociation at the tetracine C60 interface so far. Um, so this was not the end. I tried some yeah, more studies. Um, and one was, for example, applying external field um, duri uh, during the measurements, during quantum efficiency measurements. And as you see here, so from zero volt up to minus two volts, and that was the end. <laughs> I, could, I, I could not go higher in the setup. Um, our cells are very stable. So we, we, we are thinking, or you will induce uh, a band bending while, uh, while introducing uh, an external field. And 
Yeah, this we, we performed this measurement to check if we have maybe a, a problem with the band lineup. But um, so you see the, sta uh, the cells are stable at all, so maybe the band lineup is not a problem. Um, but it's not, it's not very sure yet. Then if you think about the indirect band gap, if this is maybe the problem with the, at the heterojunction to silicon, um, you could think about, and you need the additional phonon assistance, you could think about um, measuring the quantum efficiency temperature dependent. Or we are also thinking about um, putting the amorphous silicon layer in between. But those experiments have not been performed right now. But this will be the next step. Um, the question now could be, or is, why, does, why do our devices work at all? Um, so they are quite performing well, uh, only the, the tetracene is acting as the filter. Um, therefore, we again conducted um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and what we did is we compared um, palladium porphyrine samples deposited on crystalline silicon with our thin film tetracene, sam tetracene deposited on silicon. And what you see here is that a nominally 5 nanometer thick palladium porphyrine um, gives you no um, silicon signal um, from the substrate. But if you turn to, um, to tetracene, we even get for nominally 10 nanometers, so for a thicker layer, we do get a clear signal from the substrate. And you have to take in mind that this is, really, uh, this is already zoomed in. So this is a clear hint. And also in literature, it's well known that tetracene is forming islands. Um, but we cannot state at the moment if we really have maybe pinhole contacts with a highly conductive P dot PSS, which I've shown you that this hybrid junction really works fine. Or if we maybe have an ultra thin layer of one or two more layers of tetracine and then the islands um, are growing. This one we cannot state with this experiment, so we are planning to do some more experiments like high resolution AFM or transmission electron microscopy. Um, but so far, we can only state that we have some island growth, but we don't know yet if we have the pinhole contacts, which could explain the good performance of, of our hybrid cells, or if we have some few more layers of tetracine and then island growth starts. Um, yeah, so the reason, or um, the main work I'm, I will do here uh, at the UNSW, and we already did some work, so I can present you some preliminary results are to study the dynamics of the tetracene layers, um, which are deposited on crystalline silicon and also on glass. So <coughs> I've, I'll, I'll, I'll here on the left side, I show you uh, ultra-fast um, photoluminescence spectrum, where we plotted the normalized intensity on a logarithm scale on the y-axis. And on the, on the time axis, yeah, we s you see that we are from zero to 200 nanoseconds. And now I will try to explain to you um, the dynamics and what we see here in this ultra-fast PL measurement and what we want to learn from it. So we excite, after excitation of, uh, of our molecule, um, we will get a prompt uh, fluorescence, which I marked here in yellow, which is the, the luminescent transition from the excited state back to the ground state. But then, as you know, as I've told you already, um, we will have the singlet fission process, which will depopulize the S1 state and will create the correlated triplet states. And this effect is rather fast, um, within 100 picoseconds. This state then is long-lived. And what you see um, in the, in the for higher, in the higher nanosecond range is now um, the uh, triplet, so the triplets, uh, which are the triplets in the created by singlet fission, can now um, recombine and repopulate um, the, S not, uh, the S1 state, and then we can get the delayed fluorescence, which is measured here. So the delayed fluorescence we can directly di um, relate with the triplet lifetime, and this is what we're gonna, what we want to study. Um, yeah, as you see here. Um, we, we did a uh, comparison between tetracine deposited on glass and on silicon. 
And we also performed a thickness series and the hope was or is to see um, differences in the triplet lifetimes due to the effect if, if we would have charge separation at the interface, um, the triplet lifetime should be quenched and we should see differences. But until now, we do not see any differences at all, which is, but which is again in accordance to the hybrid cell results. Um, but what we do see is that um, the triplet lifetime on the tetracine layers deposited on glass and on crystalline silicon is the same. So we do have the singlet fission process in both, um, in both layers deposited on glass and on the crystalline silicon. But we do not get any hint for the injection. Um, the reason why we, <coughs> uh, why we conduct this method is um, because we are for sure this method is much more sensitive as the EQE on the hybrid cell results is. Um, yeah, so I'm nearly at the end of my talk. <laughs> I want to point out again the challenges and the open questions we have, and that's quite a lot. So the first question is, can we correlate the can correlated triplet excitons be transferred across the silicon interface? How long do the triplets generated upon singlet fission remain geminate? And maybe this is work for few or this is our work now for future. Which interlayers could help us to dissociate the triplets and then transfer them into the silicon? Um, yeah, and this brings me to the conclusion. So idea is to overcome the fundamental thermalization loss. Um, with um, using the singlet fission process and creating multi exigen generation device. We call it also spectral down conversion. Um, we implement or <coughs> we, we performed ultra fast photoelectron spectroscopy measurements to study the dynamics of our thin polycrystalline tetras tetracine layers deposited on glass and on silicon. But unfortunately, we do not see any difference at all in the triplet lifetime, so we do not get any hint for exit and dissociation at this interface as it is right now. And this is in accordance with um, the hybrid devices, which works, which is good. So tetracine does not <coughs> destroy the solar cell. Um, but so far, we do not um, have any hint also at the hybrid devices that we have exit and dissociation and charge injection. Um, so the outlook will be we have to search and yeah, we have to implement maybe an organic intermediate layer. And the idea behind that is that in the first step, we want to have the charge separation at, at the organic organic interface, which was shown in literature that it works. If you remember this more than 100% EQE. And then in a the second step, this um, separated charges should be, the electrons should be injected into silicon and the holes should be extracted at the front contact. But the challenge there will be to find um, organics with the correct band lineup. This, this is really a big challenge. <laughs> um, the other idea or way to go would be to have the charge separation at uh, this lead nanocrystals, which works and which was shown by Cambridge and MIT. And they try to put it on crystal and silicon. But yeah, this is not our business, let's say. Like this. Um, yeah, at the end, I have to thank a lot of people at my institute, at different institutes of Helmholtz Center. I would like to uh, point out our collaboration with the Helmholtz Center and the UNSW. And yeah, again, our financial support, the German Federal Ministry, the European Commission, and the German Academic Exchange Service, which allows us to, to travel and to work together. Um, yeah, and last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention. And now it's time uh, for questions and discussion. Thanks, Martin. Um, are there any questions, Dirk? Yeah, thanks. Uh, very, very impressive, interesting talk. Um, really enjoyed the UPS bit. Um, <laughs> the first question I got is you use uh, sea lion and silica, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide to grow silicon rich oxide up to SiO. Nearly, oh, nearly right. stoichiometric, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is actually very interesting because that tiny stuff stoichiometry gives very interesting mm -hmm. uh, features in oxide. I'm wondering about the carbon, because if, if you got the carbon around the chamber, does it, did you mm. actually check whether there's any carbon incorporated? Yes, so we did, we checked it with, um, we, we conducted um, FTIR measurements, um, and we had also a look at the, at the carbon peak 
in the photoelectron spectroscopy. And um, so there's a little bit of carbon, but really very less, and it's um, less than 3% of the oxygen in the layers. It will be interesting to look at the electronic structure and it's, what it's doing there. Because mm -hmm. though it's, it's a small portion, it may play a pretty decisive role. Yeah, so... I mean, it's isovalent, and there's no doping process, but yeah, it's, it may actually introduce a transport level. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but it, it stayed constant, so it's on a low level and constant. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, we have to, you have to take this into okay, account. <laughs> okay. Someone else, someone else has a question? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, yeah. How did you measure the density of interface states? Is that just CV or...? Um, QSSPC. Quasi-steady state photoconductive uh, decay. You can extract it from the, from the lifetime. Oh, we'll go to Anita. <laughs> <laughs> very, very quick. Uh, yeah. In your drawing, you had P dot, tetracine, and then an interlayer. Yes. And you said Armstrong. So, in that structure, did you have an interlayer or okay. did you have. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, I tried several interlayers. Um, so, the, the, the results I've shown you is just an HF dip, um, crystalline silicon wafer. So, yeah, I take the wafer, put it into HF for two minutes, then the surface should be covered with hydrogen, but for sure uh, we know this will not stay for long. But uh, after the HF dip I bring it directly to the glass box and then to the vacuum evaporator. So yeah, so that are the cells I, I showed you. It's not a perfect um, interface passivation, but uh, that's not the problem at the moment. Um, other interlay or other surface modification I've tried was um, methylanium passivation and um, a native grown oxide, silicon oxide. Um, yeah, but I didn't show the, the results because they were all the same. So all the cells performed and performed in the, sa in the same efficient, but uh, so this interface modification didn't change at all. Um, the EQE at least. Um, yeah, but we are now really looking for, yeah, we have to do introduce some other, maybe, or we are thinking about organic interlays right now. Or this amorphous silicon, because this is an indirect um, amorphous material. And this is easy for us to implement because we know how to do it. So you alleged nanocrystals going to be that interlay? Oh, no, um, so this is an, I guess, or I think definitely MIT and Cambridge are going to um, do this, or try it at least. <coughs> um, so they have shown that the charge transfer works at the interface between the organic and the lead selenide and lead sulfide um, nanocrystals. And then their idea is um, to, these nanocrystals can harvest the triplet energy and then they will re-emit light in this, and then you can reabsorb um, the light in the crystalline silicon. So that's more or less, it's an indirect way of harvesting the triplet energy of the, which is tra um, generated in the organic part. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna do this nanocrystal stuff, but yeah, for sure, those, those people, they will try it. Okay, um, unfortunately we've gone a bit over time, but um, we can do this conversation offline. Uh, Martin will be around for the next month, so that's, uh, Congratulations. Um, thank Martin again for this lovely talk. Thank you.